Welcome back to another edition of Components Breakdown. Today we're going to take a look at the one to four player worker placement game called Luna. In Luna, each of the up to four heads of their orders will compete for the right to decide upon the successor of the current Moon Priestess. The players will represent those orders, and over the course of six rounds, they will try to convince her of their own legitimacy for that title, by collecting as many influence points as possible through skillful placement of their novices throughout the surrounding aisles. Let's take a closer look at the game. Luna is a victory points based game that uses influence points to track and ultimately decide the strength of each player's order. Each player's goal is to influence the current Moon Priestess through a set of actions that takes place over the course of six total rounds. The order with the most influence at the end of the game will be elected as the next Luna. The game board consists of one central temple island and seven smaller isles that surround the island, each of which provides a different and unique favor to them. Each player will start the game with four groups of two novices each, as well as one shrine, all of which are assigned to the various isles that surround the temple island. Novices and favors will allow players to take actions each turn, while shrines usually make those actions cheaper to their players. Each player in turn will take one action from the 14 available actions in the game, with the scoring round taking place at the end of each of the six rounds. There are only a handful of ways in which to score points in Luna, so players' turns will mostly consist of jockeying for positions on the aisles by using their action tree to best take advantage of each round. Players' choice of actions will almost always make the overall goal of gaining more influence much easier for them to accomplish. Let's take a look at the setup of the game. In front of you is the setup of a four-player game of Luna, and as you can see, the game isn't laid out in your typical cookie-cutter fashion. The board, or boards in this case, are actually quite eccentric, and connect its player to the theme and mood of the game quite well. There are quite a few components to initially set up in Luna, so I hope everyone can follow along with me here as I walk you through each of them in order. In the center, players will construct the Temple Island by assembling the framing pieces, and then starting at the Temple Gate and moving inwards, they will place a number of randomly drawn Temple Boards equal to the number of players face up within that frame. And in this case, all four Temple Boards will be used since we have four players participating in the game. Unused Temple Boards in a game with less than four players would be placed face down and would remain that way for the remainder of the game. Players will then randomly distribute the temple tiles numbered 1 through 4 amongst themselves, at which time each player will then place their received tile, along with one of their novices, and a book of wisdom on the proper space in the temple, matching the number on their given tile. Remaining temple tiles, as well as the guard tiles, will be placed along the path around the outside of the temple as follows. First, players will place the lowest number guard tile next to the temple gate. Then starting with the highest numbered temple tile, they will place a number of descending tiles equal to the number of players participating on the free spaces of the path behind that guard. In this case, four tiles. Players will continue placing the next highest guard tiles with additional sets of descending temple tiles until the guard and temple tiles have all been placed upon the path. The guard of the temple marker will then be placed on guard tile with a value of six. There is a meditation room inside of the temple where players will then stack the four time tokens with the burning candle side up. These will be used through the course of the game to mark the passage of the current round in play. Within the temple, beginning with a designated start player, players will stack their members of the council pieces on the first space of the council of the priest area. Now, before we go any further, there are two types of setups that can exist in Luna. The pre-selected setup that I show here is a static setup, and is used to teach and better balance the game's initial introductory mechanics by pre-selecting players starting positions within the Holy Isle surrounding the Temple Island. So, for time and video purposes, this is the setup I will be using to explain in this review. However, there is a second option for setup called the standard setup, which utilizes the back sides of each of the Holy Isles and has a different set of rules associated with its setup. Now, it should be noted that the standard setup will eventually be the more preferred method for experienced players of Luna because it provides more strategic depth at the start of the game. 
Moving forward with the pre-selected setup, players will place the holy aisles on their numbered sides clockwise around the temple island board accordingly. They will then place a number of matching favor tokens equal to the number of players on each of those aisles. Next, the moon priestess, master builder, and apostate will be placed on their appropriate marked aisles. Finally, each player will place one shrine and eight novices as depicted again upon the appropriate marked aisles. Each player will likewise receive one favor token from the two aisles in which that player has no starting shrine and no starting novices. So as you can clearly see here, there's quite a lot going on at the setup of the game, which leads me directly into the rule book. Luna has a very short but deceptive eight page rule book, which initially makes the game look a lot more simplistic than what players are actually gonna experience the first couple of times that they play through the game. There's a lot of intermixing of pieces and mechanics that don't fully become apparent until you've had a chance to digest the game's 14 possible actions. So please don't be fooled by the brevity of the rules here. There's quite a lot going on mechanically within Luna, most of which can be simplified by playing through the first few rounds of the game. As I previously mentioned, a game of Luna takes place over six rounds, with each round having two distinct phases in them, an action phase and a scoring phase. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the 14 available action that players can take, but I will touch on just a few of them very briefly to give everyone a better understanding of how the game flows. So, beginning with the start player, players will take their turns in a clockwise order around the table, with each player playing a single action. Most actions in the game affect one or more of a player's novices at any given time, and or consume one of their favor tokens. The 14 available actions are more specifically broken down into four different types of categories. Those categories being aisle actions, movement actions, temple actions, and other actions. Before we get into any of these actions, let's quickly discuss the novices and the role that they will play in the game. Novices are essentially the player's workers, or the engines that drive the gameplay. Novices can either be active or inactive at any given time. The differences between these two are that only active novices may take actions. Therefore, all novices that are on Holy Isles are considered active. After taking actions that involve those novices, players will place the involved novices next to the Holy Isle which gave them that action, hence making them inactive. Now, some of the more common actions players will take on their turn include just these few. There is the Priest's Favor, which allows players to deactivate two of their novices on any one Holy Isle to gain the favor of that Isle. If players have previously built a shrine on that Isle, they will only need to remove a single novice instead of two. Players may only have at most one favor token of each type at any given point in the game. Players may recruit additional novices by deactivating two of their novices on one Holy Isle to place another one from their supply next to the Isle on which the action took place. This is called recruiting. Third, players may build a shrine on an Isle location given that they meet the following requirements in the game. They must return a shrine favor token from their supply and have two novices available on the Isle where the master builder marker is located. Players may only have a single shrine on each of the seven aisles. Now, not only do shrines provide players or allow players to use the priest's favor action for cheaper, but they are also worth four victory points each at the end of the game, as well as provide a few other gameplay benefits. The fourth action is called Promote, and players are allowed to promote their novices, which allow them to claim one of the available temple tiles surrounding the temple. To do so, players will need to remove, once again, two novices from one holy aisle to claim a free and approved temple tile that has the same symbol as the aisle in which the action takes place. An approved temple tile simply means that the tile must lie between the guard of the temple marker and the landing stage at the end of the temple path. Finally, players may sanctify one of their temple tiles by moving an already claimed and approved tile together with their novice onto the matching space within the temple. Sanctifying is a key strategy because it not only gains players influence points throughout the scoring stages of the rounds, but it also displaces or may displace or remove one of their opponent's novices from the temple. 
Now there are nine other available actions in Luna that I have not explained, but they are just as important to securing players' positions of influence throughout the game. Some actions revolve around players' ability to move both their active and inactive novices between the aisles, while others allow for players to expel the dreaded apostate, moving him onto an aisle that can negatively affect their opponent's influence. Probably the most important of these remaining actions, though, is the meditation action, which can directly manipulate the passage of time and significantly reduce the length of a round. To meditate, a player simply decides to take a single action by turning over the top time token in the meditation room. Once the last of the four time tokens is turned over, that given round effectively is over and ends which quickly becomes a very key strategy in minimizing your opponent's actions every round. Players who optimize and strategize best with their novices and favor tokens will always be in the best position should rounds end prematurely. Once a round ends, players will score influence points based on three specific criteria. First, on the Isle with the Moon Priestess, each player will count only their active novices and shrines. The players with the highest numbers of those given tokens will gain influence points according to the large printed numbers on her marker, with first place gaining 6, second place gaining 3, and third place gaining 1. Next, on the aisle with the apostate, players will count both their active and inactive novices. Each player will lose influence points equal to that count plus 1. Finally, each player will gain one influence point for each of his novices that remain inside of the temple. Now, in preparation for the next round, players will place all of their inactive novices back into their neighboring aisles, making them active once again. The Moon Priestess and the Master Builder will move clockwise on the aisles, a number of spaces equal to the large printed number on their markers. The opposite will likewise move clockwise, but only to the next aisle containing at least one novice. The guard of the temple marker will move to the next guard tile on the path around the temple, and players will restack the time tokens back into the meditation room. After six rounds, there is a final scoring phase, after which the player with the most influence points will be declared the new moon priestess. So as you can see by just the few examples of actions that I've displayed here, that there are quite a few interesting mechanics at play at any given time in the game. Which actions players decide to take on each of their turns can play a huge impact on not only their own future turns, but also the options left available to their opponents. And with everything in Luna working off the fundamental idea that players are always positioning themselves or setting themselves up for future turns, it quickly becomes a very tense and interesting race to obtain the most desired spots in the aisle and the temple areas. But what really makes this game interesting, though, is the built-in mechanic of time and how rounds are not controlled by a set number of actions for each player. It's a unique mechanic that will certainly allow intelligent players to manipulate the round's length to their advantage, which in turn solves a portion of the inherent problem that I've always had with worker placement type games, and that is whoever has the most workers gets the most actions or advantages in the game. In Luna, this is somewhat nullified because the players who best use their novices are workers will almost always be in the best position to spend their actions by reducing the time in the meditation room which inherently almost always hurts opponents who have not taken advantage of planning their actions accordingly for that round. Now although the game is not inherently or directly confrontational, there are several ways to indirectly disrupt your opponent's actions and influx of influence points. So even though the game may not carry its combative nature on its sleeve, it's most definitely a game where you'll see a lot of blocking, marker manipulation, and just overall ill will towards your opponents. I enjoy Luna quite a bit, and here's the reason why. It's a deceptively simple game to understand and play, but will almost always benefit players with strong analytical and planning skills, which is my type of game. There is very little to no luck in the game at all, so how you play the game will determine your overall success and mastering the numerous interlocking pieces of its mechanics and available actions will only come with repeated plays of the game. And that is why I enjoy it so much. It's a game of strategy, it's a game of planning, and players who are smart and best use their actions 
to the best of their advantage, are almost always going to win. So that is Luna. I am Jeremy Salinas, and thank you very much for watching.